Hi folks, Ryan Honeyman here from Lyft Economy. Many folks have come to us over the last 10 years and asked, how do I get more involved in creating an economy that works for the benefit of all life? They also ask, what skills and experiences do I need to help make this transition? So three years ago, we created something called the Next Economy MBA to help address this and similar questions. Lyft Economy's Next Economy MBA is an online course that's designed for entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs, students, recent graduates, employees, and folks who want to learn more about transformational next economy strategies and businesses. Join the growing alumni network of nearly 250 alumni who've gone through this program and learned essential skills and hopefully built lifelong relationships for catalyzing businesses in the emergent and regenerative economy. So we encourage you to check out our course. You can go to lifteconomy.com slash MBA. The next course, Cohort 7, starts on September 21st, 2021. So once again, go to www.lifteconomy.com slash MBA. And now, on with the show. Welcome to Next Economy Now. The goal of this podcast series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, equitable, democratic, racially just, and whole systems approach to creating the new economy. Welcome to Next Economy Now. So I'm really delighted to welcome to the show Sandra Kwok, who is the founder and CEO of Ten Power. Welcome to the show, Sandra. Thanks, Erin. Pleasure to be here. Sandra, why don't you begin by telling us, as the founder and CEO of Ten Power, tell us a little bit of the history of Ten Power. Sure thing. So I started 10 Power last year in 2015. And prior to that, I had been working in big data for the smart grid at a startup called AutoGrid that was using smart meter information to balance supply and demand in real time. So we were taking real time information from smart meters and then building apps to help utilities send out signals for demand response that they could actually look at demand side resources as an equivalent reliable resource to spinning reserves and ramping up renewable energy and bringing it onto the grid in real time, which was pretty exciting. It was really cool how fast the company was growing and it was very interesting being part of um, of this new smart grid movement. But when I was in grad school at Presidio getting my degree in sustainable business, we had done a, um, a student project designing a microfinance model for organic farmers collectives in rural Nicaragua to get solar power drip irrigation systems, which increased their crop yields um, and in turn created a revolving fund for communities to get solar. And we actually raised some funds and we went out there as a student group to create solar installments and to actually implement this microfinance plan. And that had always struck me as one of the most impactful things that I had done in my life. And I was hoping while starting 10 Power to to kind of combine all this knowledge and experience that I had about utilities and smart grid and cutting edge technology with and places in the world that didn't have access to electricity. So thinking about how we could not just leapfrog, but actually jetpack to something better than we've even imagined um, for humanity and for society as a whole. So 10 Power was founded with the idea of being able to, to really springboard emerging economies and developing communities into the future using best of breed technologies and harvesting all of this modern information that we have at our fingertips, being able to, to bring best practices into the future to really create a regenerative economy. Wonderful. So that was a lot there. So let's unpack some of that. Particularly, can you talk a little bit about solar and what makes 10 Power unique? I know that you leverage some pretty interesting technology. So 10 Power is providing basically the missing pieces in a lot of these economies. And um, we we went with a pretty humble learner approach. Our first market is Haiti. So um, so we, we showed up in Haiti without a, a 
specific agenda. We actually visited a lot of projects that had failed, that had come in with these great ideas. And then for, for one reason or another, within the local context, they hadn't quite played out as planned. So we just visited a ton of people and we talked to locals and we were learning from best practices that were going on. And we wanted to make sure that our unique differentiator was something that was not already existent in the local economy, but was rather supplementing what our local partners were offering. So we were creating new opportunities and jobs rather than displacing local entrepreneurs. And so what we found found to be the big missing pieces were project development and third-party finance. And third-party finance is essentially what catapulted growth of the solar industry in the United States and the adoption of solar. And um, it's something that's missing in a lot of emerging developing economies. And it essentially allows people to pay back their solar installation over time, so month over month, just like you would pay a utility bill. Um, in places like Haiti, it's very difficult to get a loan Less than 6% of the people who apply for a loan actually wind up getting a loan, and interest can be 20% or higher oftentimes. So there's very little access to capital, and everyone realizes that they need solar, but so few people can afford 100% of it up front. I mean, same goes here, right? Not, not many people could afford solar 100% up front or a house or a car. So having financing and being able to make payments over time really opens up the market and makes solar available to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. our, our first two solar installations are actually on water treatment facilities that are providing clean drinking water to the community. And um, that's in conjunction with a partner, Delo Haiti. And um, they've been working in Haiti since the earthquake in 2010. Mm. Could you say that partner again and maybe sp spell it for our listeners? Sure thing. So Delo means water in Creole. Um, it's spelled D-L-O. And um, the partner's name is Delo Haiti. Mm. So with this incredible technology, incredible vision. What are 10 Power's ambitions? Where are you headed? We definitely have global goals. So we wanted to start somewhere that was close to home where we had deep community relationships. And um, Haiti's definitely been a good first market for us and, um, and a great trial ground. There's um, there's for sure many hurdles um, to experience. I mean, not the latest being Hurricane Matthew, which um, just hit Haiti within the last 24 hours. So it's it's definitely a place with that has endured a lot of hardships and where there are challenges that, that we've learned from. Definitely we'll be able to make sure that we have an incredibly resilient business model as we enter places that are easier to work across the world. But our long-term goals as a company are to create a global platform for renewable energy to really create this next level of growth and, um, and this, this next evolution for humanity, um, which I call a fourth world nation. So, so being able to bring in best practices with renewable energy being the bedrock for all types of other amazing forward-looking technologies like water purification, uh, ecosystem restoration, shared resources, education, access to modern technology, high-speed internet, and working with partners to fulfill all of these various aspects of what the next economy is going to look like. And so, so our goal as a company is to work in places that don't currently have access to any of those resources and starting with electricity to really provide the backbone for sustainable modernization. Mm -hmm. What I really loved when we were speaking a couple days ago was your energy piece of the puzzle is not divorced from the other building blocks of a sustainable local economy and you had a really deep understanding of some pretty entrepreneurial stuff going on in Haiti in the community that you're working directly with and particularly thinking about water as a basic human need and having your solar at a water treatment plant. Can you talk about you know, what solar means in the context of a, of a local living economy, if you will? Absolutely. So energy is essentially the backbone of modernization, whether, whether we're thinking about modernization from historically what has been an industrial perspective, or if we're looking at modernization in terms of a regenerative future. Basically, every single aspect of our lives requires energy to power it, and that's from the, the most the lowest on Maslow's hierarchy of needs from clean water to water distribution to refrigeration of vaccines and food to the distribution of goods and services and, and to actually having access to global markets and being able to grow your economy. And I think that there's a lot of opportunities. You know, we have an entire portfolio of cutting edge technologies and there are so many opportunities for us to learn from all of the inefficiencies that we are having to go back and retrofit now. We we really have the chance to do things right from the beginning in a lot of these places that don't currently have access to services. So for instance in Haiti there are many many areas in the country, um, 60 to 80 percent of the population that does not have access to electricity, that doesn't have running water or sanitation or trash pickup. And we have so many different solutions for co-locating water services. For example, there are batteries that can generate electricity from sodium. So if you couple the desalinization plant that was creating clean water with a sodium-based battery factory, 
um, or you co-located a um, something that used waste heat with a um, with a, a landfill waste to energy um, <clears throat> technology. There, there's a lot of opportunities for us to to really plan out what a what a truly circular economy looks like in these cases because you're starting from scratch. Mm. So another question that comes up for me is in this community where certainly they're starting from scratch but also starting from the culture of the community that you're entering, are you creating ownership opportunities in the communities that you are helping develop and maybe parse out a little bit what ownership might mean in, in your context of how you're working with communities? We absolutely are and there are, there are several different levels of ownership. So, um, so the first is the systems themselves. So our customers are essentially renting to own their system. So the way that we structure our solar leases are that the customers make a payment every month. We price those payments so that they're saving money as opposed to what they were previously spending on diesel and diesel generators. So the customer is automatically saving money from day one. And at the end of the solar lease, they actually own the physical equipment, which overcomes a big hurdle and also incentivizes the customers to protect those systems um, from, from theft and um, to make sure that they're being well cared for. And then from a company ownership perspective, we are planning on setting up independent entities in every country that we're operating in and creating employee stock ownership programs for each of those branches. So there's definitely co-ownership in our corporate entity structure as well. I definitely want to make sure that everywhere that we're operating, that the face of our company is local. So in Haiti, the face of 10 Power is Haitian. Um, in the Philippines, it'll be Filipino. In Ghana, it's Ghanaian. In Kenya, it's Kenyan. So, so making sure that there's always a, a local person there who knows the system inside and out, who can troubleshoot it and fix it with local resources, and that there's a local number that you can call at any time during the day if you ever need assistance. Hmm. There was one other example that you mentioned in Haiti that I think would be interesting for our listeners, and that was uh, the company working on composting toilets. Is it Soil? Yeah, it is called Soil. It's um, capital S-O-I-L. Yeah, so I'm just imagining a culture or environment that might be open to really building a resilient local economy from right now that might even have more opportunity than maybe, say, in, in Berkeley where we both are right now, that there's a little bit of resistance to composting toilets or a resistance to solar because it's moving away from status quo. Can you speak to your experience, maybe some stories from personal experience of how these ideas, these resilient infrastructure pieces have been met from the local community? Absolutely. Yeah, soil is a great example of how when you're starting from square one, you really have the opportunity to completely rethink the system. And they're operating within a circular framework. So in, in nature, you don't have linear waste chains, right? So the linear waste chain is something that's essentially a human construct where we take raw materials out of the grounds and we use them and then they become diffuse carbon emissions or where we create bioplastics or um, petrochemical plastics and then use them once and then they go into a landfill. Really in nature, there's not this linear process because every output is another input for, for another process. So Soil is one of these really forward-looking regenerative companies that is embracing the cyclical and circular nature of biomimicry. And what they are doing are toilets as a service. They also are a for-profit company that was started after the earthquake. And they are offering these composting toilets where they will come and service the toilets and um, they separate the waste streams. And then they, um, they create soil enrichment with the human waste. And they actually have plants that are growing three times as high as normal plants. And they're also very much metrics focused, which is so important in the impact sphere. So they've actually worked with farmers who are purchasing the compost and done a very analytically based market calculation on which crops it makes the most sense to purchase the soil for. And so they've actually found that there are some crops that because of the market price that the output fetches, then it doesn't make sense for the farmer to spend more money on the compost, even if it increases the yield. And they found for other crops, and it makes so much sense where farmers are actually quintupling their economic gain from mm -hmm. these crops. So they've really become an integral part of the system at every aspect of the value chain. And they really understand their customers well from, from all sides, from the toilets that they're servicing all the way to the farmers who are getting the compost and then the marketplaces for those farmers' goods. Thank you for painting that picture out for us. I, I just think it's so important when we think about solar, particularly in other countries, that we think about it sort of in the context of the whole economy, of the, of the whole system. And I wonder, too, on that note, being globally oriented, what is the role of solar for our listeners in the United States? And I see it very much as a both and, you know, getting solar as much as possible in these other countries like Haiti and the Philippines and the other areas that you're aspiring to work. And 
maybe a couple remarks about um, what our listeners need to be thinking about when it comes to solar here in our own country. We are really at the point as a species where we need to take an all of the above approach. So we're past the tipping point, essentially, for the accelerating effects of climate change to completely destroy life as we know it at this point. We really need to be working on revolutionizing all of our systems right now, from energy to transportation to the built environment to agriculture. And we have all the information that we need. We have all the technology at our fingertips. It's just a matter of adoption and distribution at this point and creating the incentives for, for people to transition as fast as possible from a society that combusts carbon into emissions to a society that draws carbon down out of the air and puts it back into the earth where it belongs and it can continue to enrich our food systems. And so really solar within the United States is one of many different components of that, You know, moving towards a society that has 100% renewable energy sources and then has transportation that uses that energy. And then also in our daily lives, not creating additional waste and having the most resilient food that we can use to feed our bodies. That's also regenerating the soil. So residential solar, commercial solar in the United States is on the rise. It's definitely growing, but I cannot underscore the importance. We, we cannot be moving fast enough. We need really to have all ships pointing the same direction at this point to reverse climate change. And I think it's really up to every single individual out there to really shoulder this responsibility. Thank you for uh, alluding to the urgency. I know I know a lot of our listeners feel that every day, as do we here at, at Lyft Economy. I want to move more into this realm of you as a founder and CEO and you showing up and really taking action in, in a big way. Um, I know you've got some, some upcoming news, which you'll share with our, our listeners about maybe how they can support. But I want to ask you, what has it been like in what I perceive certainly as a pretty male-dominated industry. What what has your experience been um, as a woman entering into this solar sphere? You know, it's interesting because when I was working in utilities and smart grid, there were oftentimes conferences where I looked around and I could not see another woman at the conference. It was very eye-opening for me switching to impact, which I feel like 10 Power is not just under renewable energy and solar, but also under the impact umbrella as well. And I found there to be a lot more diversity in the category of impact as a whole. I have never let my gender or my ethnicity or how other people may stereotype or perceive me hold me back. And I think that we have, we have an obligation to act on our responsibilities, especially when it comes to sustainability. And I think that it's, it's really up to each of us to put ourselves in a place where we can thrive. And I feel very lucky that I was, you know, that in this incarnation, I'm not a plant, I'm a human, I can walk around, I can put myself in places that I need to be to thrive. I think that I've, it's been very rewarding to me being in the impact space. I'm really excited to just continue to harness all the activity, all the support. And yeah, I don't think that it really matters if you're if you're a woman or a man or you know. <laughs> and and so you you actually had a experience of feeling like you entered a sphere with maybe a little bit more female allies and being an impact. Talk about the as compared, yeah, as compared to the utility space, impact definitely has a lot more diversity. Mm -hmm. Um and I'd also like to add that I've I've just received so much incredible support from people who are, are inspired by our mission, ranging from our first investor, Judy Staley, founded REC Solar and sold it to Sunrun. So she was one of the very first solar entrepreneurs in the United States residential market. She just has this incredible wealth of experience under her belt. And she also is really a firm believer in the imperative to mitigate climate change in women's entrepreneurship in the massive global potential for solar markets. Um, and our second investor, also Rebecca Helzel, is a female impact investor who holds the same values that 10 Power and our team does. Yeah, I've, I've just been very grateful for the type of people who have been attracted to our mission. I'm going to go back to uh, the fundraising piece in a moment, but talk about this gender equality and as it relates to the actual functional on the ground work of 10 Power in Haiti. How are you promoting uh, gender empowerment, equal access, and promotion of women as leaders in the communities you're working with? Absolutely. So I think that gender empowerment and um, equality as a whole is an integral piece of how we're defining development and how we're moving into the future. So dropping off a piece of technology is one thing, but actually teaching people how to use that technology, spreading capacity building and knowledge transfer, and making sure that it's appropriate technology and collecting user feedback is hyper important to the success of the project. So we've been keeping a close eye on gender equality. It is one of the pillars of our mission. 
and we are collecting metrics on how the communities are impacted by the solar installations. So, for example, Dlo Haiti, our water purification partner, is supporting 300 micro enterprises with clean water, and the majority of those are owned by women. They're also supporting schools and um, and families in the communities that they serve. And so we're we're collecting impact metrics and how many women are served, and we're also keeping a close eye to making sure that we are hiring equally and encouraging our partners to do so. It is my long term goal to create a program to help train women and men from local communities to become solar technicians and then graduate some of them as solar installers and graduate some of those as solar engineers and make sure that we're providing access to educational resources for both women and men to be able to access global markets. Wonderful. So back on this really exciting topic of fundraising, you have done an incredible job actually raising the capital needed to grow and scale your your company. And I believe that's not a never-ending process, right? Maybe it just uh, keeps going. But because a lot of our listeners may be interested in this space as well, how to raise capital, how to raise capital on your terms, terms that align with your values and that are non-extractive ways of raising capital and getting access to the resources needed to grow your impact. Is there anything you'd like to share in terms of lessons learned or what that process has been like for you as an entrepreneur in, in this industry? Sure thing. Yeah, I, th- I think that impact is still fairly new as um, as a category. There's um, there's a lot of dialogue that's going on around impact, and our strategy has been just to reach out to as many people as possible to draw on these amazing relationships that we already do have, and just to continue getting our message out there because people have so far been really attracted to the mission and making sure that that we can you know show people what we're doing, how we're actually creating impact from an environmental, social, and also financial perspective, really embracing all. Three aspects of the triple bottom line and then from there it's just a hustle you know (laughs) so Mm -hmm. just keep on putting yourself out there Mm -hmm. and finding those relationships that work for both the investor and the project being invested in absolutely so on that note I like to bring up this question We, we often ask it in the framing of who are the people that are inspiring to you right now, who are the leaders that you're watching? And I want to kind of expand that question. What are some relationships between leaders that are particularly inspiring to you? So so both the leaders themselves, but also relationships and collaborations that are being built that you are inspired by and that you're kind of watching for guidance and insights into how you might adapt their leadership or adapt ideas that, that they're bringing up to the surface. Absolutely. So some of my heroes are Elon Musk and Sir Richard Branson. Elon Musk and um, the recent merger of Tesla and SolarCity um, and his entire manifesto for the future has been really inspiring to me and watching the growth of Tesla and SolarCity and really seeing how his dreams have manifested into reality and how his announcements of things like the Powerwall have really helped to shift the general consciousness into the the direction of visualizing a future that is powered by clean energy, where we have enough energy storage on the grid to bring in all of these resources and to do load shifting to make sure that we we have power that's coming from a variety of different sources exactly when we need it. So Richard Branson is another hero of mine, um, founded the Carbon War Room, and um, they've done an incredible amount of work in the Caribbean. So he actually just acquired a wind farm for $83 million in the Caribbean, and he is purely motivated by climate change and has just been an incredible leader in galvanizing entire countries um, around this with Carbon War Room efforts. A uh, very close to home person that I look up to who's based here in the Bay Area is Xavier Helgeson, who founded Off Grid Electric, and Nancy Fund, who I've been following for a long time, just as a leader in the space of impact investing from DBL. So DBL has recently invested in Off Grid Electric, and they are providing residential solar systems in Tanzania and are branching out to other countries in Africa. Their their success has really helped to open up doors for possibilities. You know, there's a one fifth, close to one fifth of humanity does not have access to electricity. There's so much room in this market for many different players. And seeing that these early movers are really being rewarded, that African solar was just securitized, that there are these large multilateral finance agencies that are putting in capital into these companies and that there's massive growth potential for 
whole markets to be created for, for new financial instruments, for markets, for a home for climate finance, a place where investors can get returns that's also creating social return on investment, that's also creating regenerative economics, that's also doing ecosystem restoration. You know, it's just win, 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 win all over the map. And companies like Offgrid are proving out that this is possible in African residential solar. And we're really gearing up to do the same thing in commercial solar for markets all over the world. So um, yeah, big, big thank yous to those pioneers, really people that I look up to. Hmm. You know, it strikes me as you talk about all the opportunity that is just really ripe right now in this sector, the sol specifically the solar and renewables sector, it strikes me, why are people waiting or keeping their money in the extractive industries and, you know, invested in, in mutual funds or invested in, you know, the, the fossil fuel extraction realm? What is your take on what's stopping people from really transitioning their resources to these more life-affirming renewable energy ideas and institutions? Well, I hope people are paying attention, you know, because even, even if you're just paying attention to the financial aspects of the markets, um, fossil fuels are not a good investment anymore. <laughs> you know, coal and oil and extractive industries are basically plummeting right now um, and are not occupying the Fortune 100 list anymore. So we're already seeing a market shift away from extractive and abusive industries. And I think that we're really in this ripe moment in history where solar and renewables have gotten cheap enough and where we have this huge opportunity that not that many people have woken up to yet, where there's great rewards for the early movers in this space. And I'm I'm quite excited about the divestment movement, which is the largest movement in financial history of hedge funds and university endowments divesting from carbon and from fossil fuels. And I hope to see that movement continuing into private equity and hedge funds. And I think that a lot of the forward-looking indices are outperforming the market and showing that, you know, good business is, is good business and it creates returns all the way around. So I think a lot of people, you know, may, may just not be paying attention as a whole, but, but I think that those, those who are will be rewarded and that we're, we're really setting, sitting on the precipice of one of the largest opportunities that humanity has ever seen. You know, it's, it's one of those, it's one of those things like the railroad in the 1800s or, or the internet in the late eighties or early nineties. It's, um, it's just one of those massive opportunities that comes along in a lifetime or, or maybe within several lifetimes. Right. Right. I'm really glad you brought up the divestment piece. I've been holding a lot of inspiration around uh, the Standing Rock uh, mobilization and and also how at Standing Rock they've called for solidarity actions and they have some very specific solidarity actions one being one that any listener, many listeners unfortunately in our community could take which is divesting from Citibank and Wells Fargo as we're seeing and these banks that you know have a lot of their um, their their investments in the fossil fuel industry and the coal coal industry. So I'm, I'm really glad you, you, you brought up that piece about divestment. I think there are so many opportunities at every level, whether it's individual, personal, institutional, to take that action and help push people to, to really taking that seriously based on what you described as being, this is, this is, these are real market trends. This is not, not only aspirational, but very, very real smart business, uh, smart financing. So, I want to bring our conversation to a close with asking you what are some other thoughts that you have around ways that our listeners might support you? Is it through just learning more about 10 Power? Coming, um, yeah, what, what, can, what can our listeners do to stay involved, stay connected, and, and stay in support? Mm, cool. So um, our website is www.10 pwr.com. Um, so if you're interested in following us, we have all our social media links up on our website and we'd love to see you on Facebook or Twitter. We are currently moving into raising our next round. So we're entertaining conversations with investors right now. We're always on the search for more talent and looking for expansion opportunities. So yeah, feel free to reach out. And um, once again, our website is www.10pwr.com. Like a shortened 10 power version of your website. I like that. Exactly. You must collaborate with a lot of, since you are based in, in the San Francisco Bay Area, you must be out there at events all the time and collaborating with all the other uh, exciting solar um, and impact partners um, or, or working in these spheres. So I look forward to uh, running into you at some of these gatherings, these events that, that we have so many of. We're so fortunate to to live in an area where there's a lot of people working on, on, these, on these pieces of the puzzle.
Next Economy Now is a production of Lyft Economy. To listen to all of our episodes, go to lyfteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter at lifteconomy.com slash newsletter. Please also rate and review our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.